God, thank you for those sweet truths. We do anxiously await uh, your coming when uh, our faith will become sight, when prayers will be turned to praise, because we will see you as you are in the person of your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Sincerity is something that in our day is in short supply. This character quality is difficult to find. It's rare to find, whether that be a sincere spouse, a true and faithful friend, or even a real Christian. Sincerity is a difficult treasure to come by. Divided motivations, hypocrisy, these things seem much more common. Listen to what one Puritan writer, Thomas Watson, says about hypocrisy and sincerity. He says, the wicked hate the hypocrite because he is almost a Christian. And God hates him because he is only Christian almost one. Godliness consists in exact harmony between holy principles and practices. Sincerity is not strictly a grace, but rather the ingredient of every grace. Sincerity qualifies our love. Sincerity is to grace what the blood and spirits are to the body. There can be no life without the blood, so no grace without sincerity. Open your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 2, because that is a crucial part of Zephaniah's message. The importance of sincerity in this life. He has an urgent message, which the urgency of this message bears the same weight in our day as it did in his. Zephaniah chapter 2, if you're still looking, if you're wondering where Zephaniah is, you can start at the New Testament and go four books back, and you will land at a small book by the name of Zephaniah probably a rare or just an unfamiliar part of scripture to many of us. Uh, It was for me until recently. And studying this book has been just incredible, thrilling. And to see the import of something written some 2,600 years ago uh, for this particular audience that bears an astonishing weight and importance for our day is just incredible. This morning, we will zoom in at the middle of this prophecy, chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Let me read those for us. Gather yourselves together, yes, gather, O nation, without shame. Before the decree takes effect, the day passes like the chaff. Before the burning anger of Yahweh comes upon you, before the day of Yahweh's anger comes upon you, seek Yahweh, all you humble of the earth, who have carried out his ordinances. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be hidden in the day of Yahweh's anger. This passage, this crucial portion of this prophecy, very succinctly describes the sincerity 
that all God's people must possess if they would be rescued from the day of the Lord. If any man or woman or child would escape the universal destruction of the day of the Lord, they must possess sincerity, true sincerity. It is pre- prerequisite to escaping the destruction coming on that day. And so this passage puts before us this singular point that sincerity, the sincerity that hides us in the day of the Lord bears two distinguishing marks. The sincerity that hides us in the day of the Lord bears two distinguishing marks. And you'll have to just bear with me a little bit this morning. There won't be an outline up for you. So you'll just be having to listen a little more carefully. That's the point of this passage. The sincerity that hides us in the day of the Lord bears two distinguishing marks. And we'll get to what those two distinguishing marks are. But crucial to understanding where we've just parachuted down into Zephaniah's prophecy is knowing what in the world he's talking about when he urges the nation in verse 2 to do what he's commanding before the decree, before the burning anger, before the day of the Lord. And to, to help us rightly grasp the urgency and the significant of this day that he's been speaking about, we need to back up to chapter 1. Starting with verse 2, because you can't sense the urgency until you know the danger. Once you understand the danger that he is foretelling, then you can grasp something of the urgency being warned about. Verse 2, here is what God says through his prophet. I will completely remove All things from the face of the earth declares Yahweh. I will remove man and beast. I will remove the birds of the sky and the fish of the sea and the ruins along with the wicked. And I will cut off man from the face of the earth declares Yahweh, declares the Lord. There is universal destruction coming upon the world. That's Zephaniah's message. There is universal destruction coming on the world one day. Notice in verse 2, this is complete and it's worldwide, declares the Lord. Nothing gets left out of the destruction to come. Not man, verse 3, not beasts, not birds of the sky, not fish of the sea, not what's ruined, not the wicked. Nothing escapes this day of destruction when it comes. It's reminiscent of the flood, isn't it? The things that get caught up in this destruction. Just look again at the list. Man and beast, birds of the sky, fish of the sea, the ruins along with the wicked. Everything got caught up in Noah's flood in that day. And so again, will it be with this day of the Lord? Nothing escapes the wrath to come. And just notice the order in which these things appear. Man, beast. Birds, fish. Day six, day five, day four. It's a reversal and undoing of the creation. This destruction has that kind of scope, that kind of breadth to it. That the picture Zephaniah paints is creation backwards. That is coming. The proper response, initially at least, 
The prophet records in verse 7, be silent before the Lord Yahweh. Be silent. And then the second response, initially, verse 11, wail. Silence and sorrow are the proper responses to this message about this day coming. Silence and sorrow. No protests will happen on that day. All sinners will be caught up and the destruction to come will will be perfectly, knowingly justified. He says in verse seven, be silent for the Lord before the Lord Yahweh for the day of Yahweh is near for the, for Yahweh, the Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated his guests. Then it will come about on the day of Yahweh's sacrifice that I will punish the princes, the king's sons, and all who clothe themselves with foreign garments. And I will punish on that day all who leap on the temple threshold, who fill the house of their Lord with violence and deceit. On that day, declares Yahweh, there will be the sound of a cry from the fish gate, a wail from the second quarter, with a loud crash from the hills, naming various parts of the land of God's people. Verse 11, wail, O inhabitants of the mortar, for all the people of Canaan will be silenced. All who weigh out silver will be cut off. It will come about at that time that I will search Jerusalem with lamps and I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, Yahweh will not do good or evil. Moreover, their wealth will become plunder and their houses desolate. Yes, they will build houses, but not inhabit them and plant vineyards, but not drink their wine. Listen at this description. Near is the day, the great day of Yahweh. Near and coming very quickly. Listen, the day of Yahweh. In it, the warrior cries out bitterly. A day of wrath is that day, a day of trouble and distress, a day of destruction and desolation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and battle cry against the fortified cities in the high corner towers. I will bring about distress on men so they will so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against Yahweh and their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of Yahweh's wrath. And all the earth will be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. That is, according to Zephaniah, God through his prophet, what is coming. This is a terrible day. You don't want to be here when this day comes. This day is the predominant theme of this prophecy. And as we just saw in verse one, universal destruction of the entire world is predicted. The person who would have heard this message from Zephaniah, who desired to escape if there was any possibility, would be asking that very question, how do I not be here for that? How do I not be here for chapter one? How do I escape the wrath that's coming, according to verse 17, because they have sinned against Yahweh, how do I escape what sinners against God deserve? And then chapter three tells us not only the destruction that's coming, but also the unparalleled blessing to follow. Universal destruction comes, In chapter one, 
That's what's being described. And in chapter three, the way the book ends is unparalleled blessing being poured out on the nations and Israel in particular. Just look at verse 12 in chapter three. But I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of Yahweh. The remnant that is what's left over of Israel will do no wrong and tell no lies, nor will a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. When they will feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. And then just joy. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. Yahweh has taken away his judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The king of Israel, Yahweh, is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. In that day, the same day is in view. In that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. Yahweh, your God, is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will quiet you in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feast. They came from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I am going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will turn their shame into praise and renown, a name in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in. Even at that time, when I gather you together, indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says Yahweh. The blessing described here, Israel has never known. So for the audience, Judah in particular, God's people, hearing Zephaniah's message about universal destruction and then unparalleled blessing would be asking, how do I get from the universal destruction into the unparalleled blessing? How do I escape chapter one and find myself experiencing chapter three? And the answer to those questions is chapter two. You get from chapter one to three, through chapter two. And that's where we find ourselves. Chapter two is our answer laying out for us that the sincerity that hides us in the day of the Lord bears two distinguishing marks. And we must know as we'll get to these two distinguishing marks. If we would escape the universal destruction coming on the day of the Lord and also experience its unparalleled blessing. Here's Zephaniah's answer. First, the first distinguishing mark of this sincerity that would hide us on the day of the Lord is a right person. A right person. You must be marked by uprightness, in your very person, in your being, in your life, this must be right. That's what he's describing in verse one, when he says, gather yourselves together. Yes, gather, O nation, without shame. Currently, as it stands in early 600 BC, when Zephaniah is prophesying, ministering amongst the people, they are without shame. They don't know the shame that they should know. They are shameless idolaters. They are shameless hypocrites. They are shameless 
apostates and practical atheists. That describes the nation. Just look back at chapter 1, verse 5. The destruction's coming for those who bow down on the housetops to the host of heaven, idolatry, and those who bow down and swear to Milcom, or swear to Yahweh and yet swear by Milcom. That's hypocrisy. To call themselves Yahweh worshipers as well as the worshipers of idols. Verse 6, those who have turned back from following Yahweh, that's the apostasy, and those who have not sought Yahweh or inquired of him, practical atheism, to not seek God, to not consult him for counsel. This is the audience to whom Zephaniah is speaking when he gives this all-important command, gather yourselves, yes, gather. Now, what's, what exactly is he saying there? I'm calling that, in your outline, a right person. He's calling for a right person, a rightly oriented life, a well-ordered life under God's authority. Why that? This word gather is only used a handful of times in the Old Testament. Each time that it's used outside of Zephaniah, it, it has reference, this gathering, being done to inanimate objects. And we're going to look at those just so that you can see the other references, and then we'll draw from those references what we should conclude about the command for the nation. So jump back to Exodus the first occurrence of this word, Exodus chapter 5, verse 7. What is this gathering? And we'll see it being described twice in Exodus chapter 5. This is just before the, the plague start. Moses has gone down to Exodus, commanded Pharaoh to let God's people go. They can't slay for you anymore. And Pharaoh has a problem with that, obviously. And so verse 6 is Pharaoh's response. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen, saying, you are no longer to give the people straw to make bricks as previously. Let them go and gather, that's our word, straw for themselves. So the people had a job to do, make bricks, for Phil's building projects, and they had to gather straw to make those bricks to do the job. The straw was to be gathered to be put to use for that purpose. The word appears again just a few verses later. Look at verse uh, 10. So the taskmasters of the people and their foremen went out and spoke to the people saying, thus says Pharaoh, I am not going to give you any straw. You go and get straw for yourselves wherever you can find it, but none of your labor will be reduced. Verse 12. So the people scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather, there's your word, stubble for straw. They were to take these things, collect them, and put them to use for a particular purpose in the near future. Jump over to Numbers chapter 15, the next time this word occurs, this gather. Here God's given his people plenty of law to obey. And particularly about the Sabbath, that they are to keep the Sabbath holy, not do any work on that day. And in Numbers chapter 15, verse 32, we see this word appear because there is one man breaking the Sabbath by gathering wood. Verse 32, now while the sons of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering wood on the Sabbath day. 
Those who found him gathering wood brought him to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation. They put him in custody, uh, wait to hear back from God. And then the punishment for breaking the Sabbath in this particular way was stoning. This was high handed sin for this man who gathered wood in an unlawful way at an unlawful time. But what did he do with the wood? Well, he collected it, putting it in uh, together in an orderly fashion for future use. He wasn't just gathering it just because he liked wood. He was u- intending to put the wood to use. It was useful to him. And so this gathering was an orderly collection for the usefulness of what was being gathered. And then finally, the final time outside of Zephaniah, this word occurs is in first Kings chapter 17. The people in first by first Kings 17, uh, during the days of Elijah, the prophet are continuing in disobedience and rebellion. So the curses that God predicted through Moses are finally coming upon them. Namely, a drought. It has not rained for a very long time. And so the people are running out of food in the land. In chapter 17, verse 8, the word of Yahweh comes to Elijah, the prophet, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. And so he obeys God. Verse 10, he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks again. That's our word. She's gathering sticks. He calls to her and said, please let, get me a little water in a jar that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a piece of bread in your hand. Now, he is asking for precious resources in the midst of a drought, water and bread. There's no food. We've run out of water. So, of course, she's reluctant. Verse 12, as Yahweh, your God lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I am, here's our word again, gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat it and die. And if you know the rest of the story, she doesn't. God provides very much like Jesus' miracle in the New Testament of multiplying food. The oil, the flour don't run out. And so not only the widow and her son, but also Elijah are provided for this same widow who he met gathering sticks gathering those sticks to put to use in the near future. And so what is jumping back into Zephaniah, the only reference we have in the Old Testament to this practice being done to people, gather yourselves. What's he saying there? I think what he is saying is that they are to get themselves together for use for usefulness to God. It's no mistake that each of the instances that we just looked at prior that come before Zephaniah, the usefulness is for a future day or a future soon to come. You think about the straws being need to are gathered to make bricks there. It's, it's being gathered for immediate use in the future. Uh, the sticks from the, The man who broke the Sabbath, gathering those things together for future use, and that's really, really close, immediate use. Same thing with the widow. The people by the prophet Zephaniah are told to do this to themselves. Get yourselves together, (laughs) rightly align your lives so that you are useful. This command was a matter of urgency. You can tell the urgency. You can sense his urgency because he says it not once, but twice. Gather yourselves together. Yes, he has an emphatic, yes, gather. 
Not only is the command repeated twice in verse one, but the timing indicated by verse two adds to the urgency. The word before it appears three times before the decree takes effect, before the burning anger of Yahweh comes upon you, before the day of Yahweh's anger comes upon you. There's a hurry up and do this before this event that I just called in verse 14, chapter one, near. That's near. Hurry up. Gather yourselves. Gather yourselves is the, is the idea. And to only add to the matter of urgency that this command possesses, you'll see in verse two, that second line, before the decree takes effect, the day passes like the chaff. Like the chaff, what was not useful in wheat as it was threshed, the stuff that was so light it would fall off of the kernel and just blow away with the least gust of wind, that day passes or passes over, comes like chaff. That's an indication of the swiftness of the coming of this day, which he already told us in verse 14 of chapter 1. Near and coming very quickly, he called the day. And so when he says it's passing like chaff, he is restating that same idea. It's coming in a hurry. Hurry up, gather yourselves. Don't wait. Get your life together. You must possess a right person. The first mark of your sincerity that's going to hide you, as we will see, on the day of Yahweh is possessing a right person, rightly ordered and under the authority of God, useful to him. This gathering of oneself was not only a matter of urgency, but it was also a matter of embracing proper shame. We see that again in verse 1 of chapter 2. They're called a nation without shame. That's shameful, that they are a nation without shame. And we see plenty of the same happening in our day, things that are incredibly shameful. Men dressing like women, women pretending to be men, telling others that they must be called by their own pronouns. How ridiculous. That is shameful. And we have cast off restraint and cast off any shame in our day. We too are a nation without shame. We too are a nation that ought to gather ourselves before the day comes. just remind you, this is not only a, a quality to be possessed by unbelievers, but shame is appropriate to believers as well. Just listen to Romans 6, verse 21. Paul tells the church in Rome, who is filled with all knowledge and goodness, able to instruct one another, he commends them for their shame. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you are now ashamed? They're now ashamed of things that they used to practice post-conversion, pre-conversion, before their conversion days. For the outcome of those things is death. Believers are a people acquainted with shame for what God says is shameful. Thomas Watson says the color of virtue is blushing. <laughs> blushing is the color of virtue. When you are ashamed of what should be, of what you should be, that indicates that there is some virtuous property in you. Finally, the, this right person uh, that he's calling for, this right orientation of each person is also a matter of personal responsibility. It is a matter of urgency and of embracing shame and also of personal responsibility. Just notice to whom the command comes. 
He doesn't say somebody else go gather somebody else. He says, y'all, you, that's the, the command implied in the command, gather yourselves. You person must take personal responsibility for yourself. It is incumbent upon you the burden and weight of this duty is laid on each person who's a part of the nation. You must prepare yourself, must rightly orient your own person underneath God's authority and make yourself useful. You must do that. Children, that's not your parents' job. Before God, that is your job. And your parents do have an obligation to God for you. But you, child, it is your responsibility to bring yourself under God's authority and be useful to him. And the rest of the adults, the same thing applies. It is not your wife's job to make you useful. It is not your husband's job to gather you. Before God, each of us has this responsibility. That is going to be a distinguishing mark of the sincerity that hides anyone who is hidden on the day of the Lord. That kind of sincerity. And if you were here for equipping hour, we talked about this from Philippians 2, 12 and 13. When no one else is around, you must be marked by this, a right person. The thoughts that pass through your mind must be upright before God. The motivations that compel you to act must be upright before God and useful to him. The desires that you have in your heart when no one else is there to see them must be righteous before God. And we recognize none of us does this perfectly. None of us does this perfectly. What God is calling for is sincerity, not even perfection, as it's stated here. You can be sincere without being perfect. You, you will falter. We all do. Yet the one who strives against whatever is wayward in him sincerely, that person is going to be marked by these things. That person is going to be marked by sincerity. So the first mark is a right person. The second one is like it. The second mark of the sincerity that will hide us on the day of the Lord is right pursuits. Right pursuits. And we get three of them in this third verse. Seek the Lord. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Those things mark the one who will be hidden on the day of the Lord. A pursuit of the Lord, a pursuit of righteousness, and a pursuit of humility. As we already read in chapter 1, verse 6, the wrath of God is coming specifically for those who have turned back from following Yahweh and those who have not sought Yahweh or inquired of him. That is the particular sin, a particular sin in view for why the wrath of God is coming. Not seeking the Lord, not inquiring of him, not caring what God thinks so that you can bind yourself to his thoughts, to his wisdom and bring your own life in submission to what he has said. The wrath of God is coming for that reason. This word, seek, 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 that word carries with it the idea, just implicit in that word, is one of desires and direction. 
the desires of the person doing this are in view so that he's seeking Yahweh because his heart is in that direction. He wants God. He desires God. And not only God, if anyone was mistaken in saying, hey, I love the God, I love the Lord, I just don't obey him, he attaches with that first pursuit, the second two, righteousness and humility. The person who sincerely seeks the Lord also seeks righteousness and humility. There is not a division between those things. If you're wondering how strong are my desires for God, look no further than how strong your desires are for righteousness and humility. No man has ever desired God more than he has desired obedience. No one has ever desired God more or sought the Lord more than he has sought submission and humility under God's authority. That is a telltale sign of whether or not we are sincerely seeking the Lord. He also does not say, hey, seek the Lord and you'll stumble into obedience. But he puts them all together as parallel commands. Seek the Lord. And as intentional as you are in seeking the Lord, seek righteousness and seek humility. They all go hand in hand. He also doesn't say the inverse, seek righteousness, seek humility, and somehow you'll eventually seek the Lord, find yourself seeking the Lord. But they're all parallel. He just gives them all to us together. Notice the audience, uh, specifically what he calls those who would obey this command, the ones he's calling to keep this command of these three pursuits. All you humble of the earth, the ones who have carried out his ordinances, the ones who take God's word and bring their their own thoughts, their own desires, their own intentions and way of life underneath God's authority so that they do the very things he's commanded them to do, his ordinances. As it says in verse three, <clears throat> all you humble of the earth who have carried out his ordinances. This is what humble people do. This is what obedient people do. They seek the Lord, they seek righteousness, and they pursue humility. You might do well later today, later in this week. Just ask the people who know you best. Do I seek humility? Do I seek righteousness? Would you, would you describe me in that way? When you think about, you know, whoever comes to mind, when you have in your mind the humble of the earth, you know, Tom Angstead and others. <laughs> would you put me in that category? You should ask. And if you're afraid of the answer, then all the more. The ones who are the humble of the earth, who carry out God's ordinances, who pursue the Lord in righteousness and humility, there is good hope for them. By God's grace, the ones that he has worked in such a way to be characterized by these things, by these pursuits, by these descriptions, look at the hope that Zephaniah holds out for them at the end of verse three. That day that I just talked about, that wrath that I just talked about, well, perhaps you will be hidden in the day of Yahweh's anger. That perhaps language uh, is, is the prophet's way of saying there is still a chance. This day that is hastening and coming quickly, that could be as, as easily brought about as chaff blown by wind, 
Perhaps if you do this, you'll be hidden. That, that means that there will be a safe place for you to hide from the wrath to come. That's hope. That's grace. That is kindness. That even though people who don't perfectly gather themselves, who have not always practiced this, who have not always had undivided allegiances and singular pursuits. If you do this now before the day comes, you can be hidden. You can still escape the wrath to come. That's good news. And that's the way that Zephaniah, in his own unique way, in his particular day, that's the good news he has for his people. That's the way God decided to articulate the gospel in this book of your Bible. You can be hidden from the day of the Lord, from the judgment that you deserve coming with that day, with that wrath, if you bear these genuine marks of sincerity. You might be wondering, well, if I have to gather myself, if I have to pursue these things, isn't that like preaching a works-based salvation? Isn't that a gospel of works? And the answer is no. No more than it was a gospel of works when Jesus, who talks about coming wrath, said, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He gave them a command too. Just ask yourself a question, uh, this question, who would do these things? Who would hurry up and as a matter of urgency, gather themselves and seek the Lord and seek righteousness and seek humility? Not someone who's not humble and certainly not someone who doesn't already believe what Zephaniah has already said. Faith would have been the impetus to even obey the commands given in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Nobody's going to do this who doesn't already believe what he said in chapter 1 about the coming day of the Lord. To even obey the command to repent, to obey the command to humble yourself under God's authority, become useful to him and seek him. No one does that who doesn't believe God already beforehand. And so the prophet can, with no caveats or qualifications, lay the commands before them to be obeyed because the only ones who would obey these commands are those who possess saving faith. Repentance is necessary to enter the kingdom. And those who repent are those who believe God. Repent and believe. The message of Zephaniah is not different than the message of the apostles. There's more revelation. There's a specific name attached to the Lord, Jesus. So the one who brings the day of the Lord, the one whose day it is, has a name now. Jesus, but the message is remarkably the same. Go to Matthew chapter three, and I'll show you this. What was John the Baptist's message? You know, he's kind of like a new Old Testament prophet. You know, he's in the pages of our New Testament, but he's before Jesus chronologically. So does that make him old or New Testament? I like to think both. He's a a helpful bridge between the two Testaments. Well, what was his message? Matthew 3, verse 7. But when John saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Sounds very Zephaniah-like. Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. 
And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. The ax is already laid at the root and the trees there, uh, of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit and is cut down and thrown into the fire. You don't bear fruit in keeping re- repentance like gathering yourself, like seeking the Lord and righteousness and humility, those trees are are thrown into the fire. What about the apostles? Paul was a prominent apostle. Fast forward to 1 Thessalonians. Was his message different than John the Baptist or Zephaniah's? The answer again is no. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We know that Paul's message wasn't different, not only because it's articulated for us in Acts, But he told the Thessalonians what he told them, and then they responded, which tells us they got the message. What did they learn to do when they responded to Paul's message? 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, they themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you did this. You turned to God from idols to do two things to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. Paul must have gone into Thessalonica and said, wrath is coming. Wrath is coming. You can be rescued from the coming wrath by Jesus. And Jesus does rescue from the wrath to come. How does he do it? Zephaniah didn't know, but there's a hiding. There's some sort of rescue, some sort of safekeeping for those who sincerely follow the Lord. How that happens, I don't know. God hadn't told me Zephaniah could have said, but believe it, it's coming. But Paul had those answers. Here's how it happens. Chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians. Verse 15, for we say to you by the word of the Lord, or better translated, I think, a word of the Lord. This is new revelation. That we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Let's just keep reading verse verse one. As to the time and epics, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night, while they are saying peace and safety, not wrath and destruction, peace and safety, well, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. That's the universal destruction Zephaniah talked about. But you, brethren, y'all are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you. The day is not for you. For you, verse 5, are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night. Those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and a helmet, as a helmet, the helmet, or excuse me, the hope of salvation. What salvation? Well, verse 9, you have not been destined for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus died to rescue his people from the wrath that's coming on the day of the Lord. For us, this, the same message applies You're not rescued from the day of the Lord because you attend Grace Bible Church. You're not rescued from the day of the Lord because you're a part of a Christian family. You grew up under the 
instruction of faithful parents. There must be a sincerity that you possess, Christian, if you would escape this terrible, dreadful day that's coming. You can be hidden in that day so that you escape the universal destruction of chapter one in Zephaniah. And one day, when God brings us again with Jesus to return, we can experience too, along with all the other faithful saints of old, the unparalleled blessings to come when God brings his son's kingdom to earth. And by God's grace, we will succeed. Let me just pray for us. We're not going to have a last song. I'm going to pray and dismiss us. God, thank you so much for these wonderful, undeserved promises. You are so kind to preserve for yourself a remnant of your people. To lay out clear instructions for us so that we might, as those who just take you at your word, do what you said to do. It is so simple and yet impossible to accomplish on our own. So we pray that you would be at work in us to both will and to work according for your good pleasure, that you would be pleased uh, with us to accomplish these things and that you would be pleased, we pray, to bring Jesus to come rescue us from the coming wrath. We would be pleased to see him now to know this hiding, to know this salvation from the day of the Lord. Even now, as we carry out the various activities we have, the rest of today and this week, let us not forget to pray, come Lord Jesus. And until you do, God, use this message of Zephaniah, of John the Baptist, of the New Testament apostles, that wrath is coming. Use that message to make us more compassionate, zealous evangelists, that we would in compassion tell our friends, tell our family, tell our neighbors, tell people who don't want to hear this message, tell people who do, that this would be uh, our message and that you would be pleased with the way that we hold forth this message of life. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much for coming this morning. If you have any questions about anything you've heard, uh, or if you would like prayer, then you can uh, just wait over here to my right, your left, and there's some people uh, willing and eager to pray with you. Thanks for coming. You're dismissed. Have a great week.